Jane Lo and I'm at Light Hat Asia 2025 here and with me today I'm very pleased and very privileged to have Ariel Herbert Boss all the way from United States to share with us on the uh, latest trends in our AI security. So thank you so much uh, Ariel for your time today. Oh, thank you, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Yes, yeah. so when it comes to, you know, AI, you know, there's a lot of buzz, but of course AI has been in cybersecurity for a long time. So what is this buzz about, about, you know, the latest generation of, uh, well, latest iteration of Gen AI? Yeah, so I mean, I'm, I'm sure that everybody and their mom has heard about ChatGPT, and I think that's a big reason for why we have AI so front and center in cybersecurity right now. So, but historically, there's actually been a decent amount of AI involved in previous versions of, of cybersecurity tools too. Um, like, for example, being able to tell if a website that you're vi visiting is a login page or not is something that people have been able to do for the last 10 years. Um, but there's a lot new capabilities that have come out in the last, you know, like five uh, to two years uh, that I think make it uh, a lot uh, more interesting um, for the space at the moment. So I think a lot of people are thinking, you know, the um, who, who has used our uh, chat GPT or, you know, uh, the uh, Google Gemini uh, chat, chatbot AI, right? Uh, they can appreciate, you know, the summarization capabilities, right? The generation capabilities, report writing. And then we try to project that capabilities onto the space of cybersecurity. And we imagine that it's enabling cyber defenders to be able to uh, write reports a lot faster, to be able to uh, find uh, information about vulnerabilities a lot quicker, to hunt for threats a lot faster. Is that all um, misconception? No, I think that's actually pretty accurate, which is kind of exciting. <laughs> yeah, so um, one of the exciting things for the attackers is that now uh, that we have these same kind of capabilities that the defenders are using, we can also use them to make uh, proofs of concept much faster. Uh, we can uh, exploit things that we find much faster. We can then, you know, write our own reports uh, for, for like the teams that we're writing these exploits for as well. Like there's a lot of opportunity to build for the attacker in addition to the defender, which makes things kind of exciting. And you have been in the uh, offensive uh, cybersecurity area for a long time. So what are the exciting sort of developments you've seen in terms of people applying that, uh, this iteration of Gen AI to, you know, offensive uh, cybersecurity? So I think the most exciting thing right now is that um, there's this thing out that's called like a model context protocol, which allows you to use uh, just regular tools with language models. So this is a capability that's been around for a bit. Um, language model researchers have known that this is a capability that you know you could probably do for the last you know, like three or four years, but it hasn't been until recently that we've actually been able to deploy it more uh, easily to the public. And so what um, MCP is, is it allows you to build um, like harnesses for tools and then be able to run those tools by using a language model. And that's what unlocks a lot of the uh, agentic approaches that we're starting to see in cybersecurity and beyond. Yeah, so, okay, so talk about, talk to us about agents, AI agents, what are they? Right, so agents I think are kind of an overloaded learn. Um, so when we're using um, language models, like we're, we're prompting the model and we're asking it to then generate something after that. So an agent is basically the same thing, it's just it's the style in which we're prompting it that makes it a little bit different. So you can kind of think about uh, scripting is where you're, you're writing some code, you're running that code and that code is doing something in a computer. Uh, you've got uh, traditional AI models which are making decisions based off of data, so you're reading data in, the model is uh, doing some computation, and then it's generating like a you know, data set report. Uh, but this latest generation of models allows us to uh, sort of treat, um, treat these language models in a way where we can ask them questions and then they'll give us responses. And then we can do this question response uh, almost autonomously by having it go out and uh, almost like make decisions on our behalf, which is kind of scary. But uh, in the right context, um, they can actually do things that uh, make it much easier for us to also do our own work. So mm -hmm. um, they can actually augment a lot of workflows that they previously couldn't. Right, you, you, you mentioned that uh, it could be a little bit scary. So what kind of uh, sort of uh, risk do you see or potentially will manifest? Yeah, so when using language models, I think something that comes up a lot is hallucinations. Uh, so the model, as one of its features, is that it's able to uh, come up with like new creative things as it's, every time you ask it a question, it's going to generate something in response. And that generation might be, you know, like 98% accurate, but then there's like this 2% of like it might make up something. And for a lot of cases, that's fine. Uh, but for some cases, that's maybe not fine. And in the context in which you're trying to deploy one of these agents that's going to go out and make decisions on your behalf, you want to make sure that it's not going to be 
be making bad decisions on your behalf. That's right, yeah. Um, but you can also sort of think about the way in which you deploy these. Also think about maybe like a young intern that you've just had to join your team. Mm. Um, maybe there's a context in which you wouldn't want to have an intern or you don't want to give an intern access to these sort of tools because they might not know any better. Um, that's one way in which you can limit um, when you're deploying a, a, a agents in a particular context, how you can limit them uh, from causing accidental harm. Yeah, I was going to ask you about some mitigation measures, but before we go to that, right? So talking about hallucination, I think there's also a closely related concept called po false positives, right? Mm, yes. So how is that uh, different or similar to hallucinations? That's a great question, actually. So uh, false positives in statistics is where um, you've done some sort of classification and you have a set of answers for whether or not a thing is, like, say, like a hot dog or not a hot dog. Mm. Uh, but you might run into a picture where the model says this is a hot dog, but it's actually not. Like maybe it's a hamburger instead. Um, we call that a false positive. So this is something that we run into with language models as well, because if you use them in the context of um, doing classification, you end up with the same sort of issue. So it's kind of like the same... Um False positives has been around for a long time, I guess, with in traditional AI, but right. with uh, with uh, Gen AI is introducing this uh, emerging hallucination risk. Right. Yes. So the reason why this is present now, or the reason why this is present now, is because we're using generative AI, where we're generating things That's versus right. classifying. Yeah. So the previous version, all mm. of the models that we have that we're using today, they're all deep learning models, which means they're all layers of, you know, stacked. There are a bunch of stacked layers uh, yeah. within a computer. Mm. But the things that make these models different is the way in which we interact with them. So for the previous generation, it was all um, discriminative, which means you're trying to ask the model if something is a hot dog or not. Uh, but now we have generative, where we're asking the model to generate a bunch of text. And um, similarly to when you have a model that you know maybe makes the wrong decision as to whether or not something's a hot dog or not, um, now we have the model that maybe makes the wrong call as to like what the next token it should be that it generates. And then in that case, that's what becomes like a hallucination. Yeah, I think um, one um, mitigant uh, in the traditional AI space is uh, to recognize that AI is a black box and there has to be a way to explain some of the decisions behind why AI is making the decision. Now yeah. with Gen AI, it's a lot more difficult, isn't it? Yes and no, actually. So uh, yes, you're right that it is harder to tell like what is happening behind the scenes because we don't really have access to the training data. So therefore, mm -hmm. we don't really yeah. know like what has gone in. But on the flip side, we're now starting to see these techniques called chain of thought, where you can actually see the, the chain that the model is able to uh, sort of reason through as it's making a decision, which is very helpful for figuring out if it's going to make the right decision or if it's going to make a decision that might, you know, down the line, it might cause some harm. Right. Earlier you talked about, uh, you, you touched on very slightly about uh, prompts, right? Uh, yes. Right. And that's the distinguishing uh, feature when it comes to Gen AI. So have you seen some of the interesting sort of uh, risks they in introduce in terms of prompts? Yes, of course. So we, uh, I think prompt injection is the most obvious one, where you can ask the model to ignore all the instructions that it's been given prior and then, you know, do whatever it is you want it to do, which is, you know, maybe... Uh, say the word banana five times. So when it comes to, you know, some of these uh, threats, these uh, emerging threats, right, uh, what are some of the uh, measures that you've seen that works quite well as safeguards against some of these threats? Right. I'd say the big one is figuring out what it is that you want the model to do and then build what we call guardrails. So right. making sure that as the model is making decisions that it can't you know, fall off the guardrails. That, of course, is very difficult to do unless you know exactly the context in which you want to deploy the model. Uh, but so far, that's been the best technique that people have come up with. Right, okay. So uh, in terms of guardrails, then, you say that uh, it's the best technique, but operationally and, you know, what kind of challenges have you seen people uh, encounter when they put in some of these guardrails? Because obviously, prompt engineering and attacks is still quite successful, so yeah, it's not yeah. working as well as we want it to work. I think part of it is that as uh, models get better and like these language model providers like OpenAI, Anthropic, Google, Meta, um, as they put out new models, uh, we don't really have a good sense of how to track changes between those models because behind the scenes, we're not really seeing when they're releasing a new version. Like they'll announce whenever they re release one that's like a step change in terms of capability. But behind the scenes at all these places, you know, people are constantly kind of fiddling with it, trying to figure out like, is this going to be one that, you know, moves the needle for these particular uh, use cases that we are imagining that our customers really care about. Um, and so that makes it kind of tricky to figure out like, okay, so so we, we see that like one day uh, the, this technique for building guardrails might work, whereas tomorrow, depending on you know the whims of the, the companies, it might not work as well. So in that context, um, we find that it's very helpful to get a good sense of like your evals. So figuring out what are the contexts in which the model needs to perform well, design a bunch of uh, techniques and uh, or design a bunch of tasks for the model to do and then measure its performance on those tasks periodically and see if that changes over time and then use that uh, to then inform uh, what you're doing around your guardrails design. 
Right, so it has to be a continuous exercise. It's exactly. It's a one-off deployment and then, right, yes. right. Yeah, there's, there's no free launch here. And I think that one sort of emerging uh, technique is also uh, using this, uh, practicing this human in the loop con kind of yes. concept as well. Yes, like being able to uh, have some human in the loop to make sure that as the model is doing its thing, you have somebody who's you know, periodically checking to make sure that the model is staying on track with what it's supposed to be executing on. Right, okay. So an, another uh, sort of uh, concern people have is, you know, thinking about all these uh, gen AI and integrating into their own infrastructure, right? Mm. Uh, it's going to expand the attack surface. Yes. Right. So what have you seen so far? Is, is that a valid concern? I think it's a valid concern for sure. <laughs> and it, it comes down to like, where is the context or what are you actually deploying the model in and what do you want it to do? Because if you're going to give it, you know, read, write access to like a database, you probably don't want to do that because, you know, it's like giving an, an intern access to these sort of things. Like that intern might be very smart, but they might not know any better and they might accidentally, you know, knock something over that maybe they shouldn't. So we, we found uh, limiting the access that models have to certain parts of your infrastructure to be helpful, uh, figuring out how to make a good scope for where you're going to be deploying these models to be helpful, and then getting really, really crisp on what your attack, um, what your attack surface looks like, and what is your threat model. So the most common threat model for these language models that we found to be, you know, the most realistic is uh, anything that goes into the model. You want to make sure that we can either sanitize it somehow, or have a sense of like who is going to be having access to that prompting um, intake. If that mm -hmm. makes sense. So a lot of it sort of falls back to. I guess are traditional best practices when it comes to um, uh, building and uh, securing your infrastructure, isn't it? Like yeah. access control, authentication. Yes, exactly. Yes, which I think, you know, hopefully takes some pressure off of folks because I think the big unknown of like, now that we have AI, you know, it kind of causes some CISOs to panic a little bit because you're like, oh no, like yet another thing that I have to figure out that I don't have a lot of information on how it's going to work. But I think since you can kind of think about AI is just software at the end of the day, it's kind of different software than maybe we're used to, but it still has and is governed by, you know, the laws of physics, which means we can kind of treat it similarly to how we treated in the past. You know, we need to evolve some of these techniques that we've been using, but we can kind of re repeat uh, some of the techniques that we found to be helpful in the past as well. Right. One last question I think is on top of people's minds is like, you have been in offensive uh, cybersecurity for so long, and now you see this gen AI coming in, right? And possibly um, improving the productivity, but also disrupting the workflow. So yeah. what do you see in terms of, you know, how, what kind of transformation changes um, gen AI will bring to cybersecurity? What I'm most excited about is like the ability to scale. Like previously, we haven't really seen that kind of like the level of opportunity that we have today because language models can generate code, they can generate images, they can help us parse through tons and tons of data. Uh, we can use them to drive tools. Like maybe as part of like our work as offensive security experts, we've built up in our heads like these models of how to use certain tools, how to read into the environment based off of oh, I'm seeing this, therefore I'm going to use this tool here. That's a lot of a lot of that we can kind of take and take out of our brains and maybe you, you view into the machine now, which is exciting. Because mm -hmm. then that frees up uh, space for us to then focus on some of the things that humans are uniquely good at and mm -hmm. like creative and take a, apart a lot of the things that maybe we don't want to be sp spending our time on as much. Yeah, there's a kind of a view that, you know, there's a definitely long-term sort of benefits, right, that people can look forward to that we can be excited about. But the immediate sort of concerns, I think, is uh, not too far from people's minds in terms of what yes. they, they need to rescale or upscale, right, to adapt to these changes. But changes right. are change is constant, isn't it, nowadays? It is, yeah, yeah. I think the, the one piece of advice that I give to folks is like, don't be afraid to experiment mm -hmm. because there's a lot of there's a lot of information out there about what AI is capable of, but not all of it is accurate. And you won't actually know that unless you're willing to play mm. with the models yourself. And we're in this golden era of being able to, anybody can have access to these sort of things, you know? Like there's, there's like a new model drop that's coming from a bunch of different companies you know, like on a weekly basis that's at this right, point. Yeah, there, and so there's a lot of, I mean, it, it can be overwhelming, but there's also a lot of opportunity to just, you know, play with things. And mm. I think um, that's probably the most important thing I'd recommend for making sure that you're staying relevant. Right, yeah. We don't know what the risks are until we actually sort of have, have used it ourselves, right? Right. So um, I, I, I did mention that, that that was my last question, but I got <laughs> one last question. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, I know prediction is very hard. And, you know, ev every day, like you say, we see all these new models coming in. Uh, we are excited about the promises of uh, innovation and transformational changes. But at the same time, there's a lot of concerns as well. What do you see, you know, is the biggest sort of uh, uh, understated, you know, concern? It's a good question. 
so in the 70s, IBM had this manual um, for how they were using like their version of AI in the 70s. And it said something to the effect of um, a computer cannot be held accountable. Therefore, a computer must never be responsible for a management decision. And I think we really need to remember that because uh, we're, we're kind of in this era where people are excited about putting agents in a context where we're kind of treating them like employees. Um, but how are we going to be able to hold agents accountable? Like, and who should be held, held accountable? Should it be uh, the model provider company? Should it be the person that coded up uh, that particular agent? And I think we need to make sure that we're thinking about these kind of questions as we're building. Yeah, that's a good takeaway, actually. The governance uh, questions around AI, right? Uh, we don't, we, we can't lose sight of the uh, the roles and responsibilities while we are very excited about the promises it can bring, right? Right, we have to remember the human. Right, yeah, exactly. So the human is still number one in this AI era. Right? So thank you so much, uh, Ariel, for your time today. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you for, you know, giving us a very brief uh, sort of uh, take on these uh, innovations that uh, Gen AI is bringing to the cybersecurity area and uh, what it means for cybersecurity uh, defenders as well. So thank you so much. Thank you, appreciate it.